Hello, and welcome to History by the Pint, a new podcast that covers all things history and archaeology in the time it takes to drink a pint. My name is Alex Rosen, I'm a TV producer and author, and with me is Glyn Davis, a curator at Colchester Museum, and Chris Shevitsky, a lecturer and researcher in Rome. Now, we originally studied together at the British School in Rome, way back in 2007, and since then we've been regularly meeting up for a pint and to discuss what we've been working on and the latest news in the world of history and archaeology. That habit has now evolved into this podcast series. To kick things off, Glyn's going to be chatting about his new exhibition, Gladiators, A Day at the Roman Games, and one very special artefact from Roman Britain. Well, so how, how did you get into organising this exhibition then? Was there something that was the catalyst for, for thinking, you know, let's do Gladiators or, or, or what? Yeah, I, I think so. I think really the catalyst was a it's a star object in a in the collections of Colchester Museum. So that's that's who I work for. I work for Colchester and Ipswich Museums, and I work I work at the, the the end of Colchester Museums in Essex, and we have in our collection uh, an object that's called the Colchester Vase, and it's a pot. If I explain it really basically, it's a pot with gladiators on it and other arena scenes. Um, but actually, it should be one of the most famous pots in Roman Britain, and it's probably one of the best made pots in Roman Britain. Now that is quite a statement to make because I tell you what, I dug up a lot of pots. <laughs> <laughs> from Britannia, yeah, that, from Roman yeah. Britain. But um, we knew this was a star object, and I'd done a previous exhibition called Decoding the Roman Dead, and um, this pot, the gladiator pot, if you want to call it that, or the Colchester vase, that's quite an old old way of calling it, I suppose, outdated way in some ways, there was a cremation in there. So we studied the cremation as part of that, that project, uh, and it was really interesting. It turned out the person buried in the Colchester vase of all these lovely uh, scenes of, the, uh, of arena combats on it was a, was a male. So biologically, sexed as a male. They were over 40 years uh, at the age of death uh, and they had a little bit of uh, pathology on them. So, you know, they're a little bit worn. That's what's, what's mind-blowing is I think a lot of people don't know. You could, you could do a whole podcast on this. A lot of people don't know that cremations, we can work these things out. You can work out uh, biological sex, age, pathology, all these things, because back then people weren't going through a machine, uh, like a crenulator, grinding you to dust. They'd take a sample from the pyre and place it in the receptacle, you know, sometimes a pot. Not always. You could just pour it into the ground. That was completely acceptable too. Um and that's really interesting, I think, that we can work these things out from the cremated remains and really specialist osteologists, so people who study human bone and then specialise in cremations because it's so fragmented, the bone can work that out. So that was fascinating. And we did some really whizzy science. I'm going to call it whizzy science because I'm not a scientist. We undertook isotope analysis on the petrous bone that survived. So we all have um, a petrous bone uh, in each ear so we have two petrous bones and this is something we can um, study we can analyze for a chemical signature called an isotope and we studied the strontium isotopes and by doing this you can essentially work out where someone would have grown up so these bones kind of absorb the the background strontium of what you're drinking what you're you're eating from the region and it lays down a signature that's captured in the bone. And it's no different, you know, in some ways it's different, but it's like uh, ancient DNA analysis as well. It's, it's how the bone and elements of the body are capturing signals and signatures that scientists can interpret. So you can tell us where he comes so we from. Work with, Is that it? We, well, can <laughs> we? Can we I, don't, I don't know. That's what that's what I'm assuming we're getting to. I, this I is, can, it, I can tell you. Okay. Is he is he from Colchester? You, you can tell us where he didn't right there. You basically said, so where's he from, Glenn? We don't where's need five he, where's minutes he from? to talk about that's science. That's the thing. Is he from Colchester? I can tell you where he's not from. Okay, where's he tell you where he's not from. Would you like to know that? Yes. Shall I tell you that? Well, he's not from Essex. He's not from Essex. Is that because he doesn't have a tracksuit? He's not from Roman Essex or the area we now call Essex. So he's what we call a non-local. Okay. Okay. However, you know, if you're thinking fancy exotic places, ooh, like Pompeii or Rome, Chris, because you're obsessed. Um, Possibly not. He could be from the West Country all the way down Western England. Oh, there we go. Or North North up to Scotland. But local in the sense that you can can pinpoint it to Roman Britain. You can pinpoint it to Britannia. Well, he could also be from uh, regions of Italy or or Thrace. Regions of Italy, just not Roman Pompeii. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why. So, what the scientists can't do is go right. Here's the strontium signature. Here's your isotope signature. These are all the places they could have come from. 
it doesn't work like that. It works the opposite. They go, this is the strontium signature. Tell us where you want to look. And I go, okay, well, we know at Colchester, we have so the famous... Um, Facilis, Favonius Facilis. He's he's immortalized in a in a tombstone sculpture and his name recorded. He's one of the first centurions who comes over with the Claudia, uh, Claudian invasion of Britain, and it's the earliest uh, tombstone uh, inscription and sculpture from Britain. So we we know we have an Italian. So we go, okay, he's Italian. He's most likely Italian. Can you check out Strontium? Uh, you, you know, signatures across Italy using maps and all these other things. And they do that. Then we go, oh, we know we also have a person from Frace. Anyway, you see where I'm going this. We have to tell them where to look. You don't have one big map. And that is quite frustrating. What would be less frustrating is if we had another chemical signature, another isotope to measure. So we're getting on to a completely different thing here, aren't we? <laughs> no, well, no, can, no, no, I can, no. I can I'm, round I'm it curious. up. I want to I'll know keep this. talking. I'll keep, I'll keep banging on No, I want to know this. What would be great is if we had another uh, isotope we could measure. Now, in inhumations, so we're not talking about in cremations where you've been burned, they look at the oxygen isotope, okay? Now, <laughs> in cremations, that has clearly, obviously, been completely burnt out of the body. So you've literally lost the, the oxygen isotope. So what you would do with the oxygen and strontium isotope in inhumate, it's almost like, you know, on a graph, cross-referencing it. And that helps you pinpoint someone. Now, you can't do that with cremations. Um, the, the oxygen isotope will just won't survive. But they are starting to work on the lead isotope. So what we have done, we have resent the 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 um, isotopes uh, from all our cremations we were studying, including the person in the Colchester vase, this 40-plus male, and we're going to get it tested for, for the lead too. And I'm hoping, you know, however they sort of, co you know, analyse that, coordinate that, it cross-references with the strontium. And actually, we instead of going, well, he could have been from Britain somewhere or anywhere else in the empire, sort of, we can we can say something a bit more specific. But what is interesting is we know they're not from a, around this place and not from around what was Roman Essex. So that that is, you know, I think a lot of the times when you apply this science, and it is fantastic, this is why working as a curator in museums, I think it's fantastic that we retain collections. And people can say, why would you keep all that old stuff? It's, it, you know, it's a good question. You know, we spend a lot of money looking after it and we're taking more and more in. And the reason is that science, for the most part, keeps changing and people come up with new research objectives and we can apply this new science. And this is a classic case of unlocking hidden stories that we just wouldn't have been able to answer. So although I can't be specific, we can actually say something. And again, I've just said, lead isotopes, we're working with Durham University now, and they think they're, they're going to start trialling this. So we might be able to, to pinpoint this, this chap even further to where he was from in the Roman Empire. Is there anything about the find location that can tell us a little bit more? Was, was he found in, in situ in a cemetery? Was the cemetery zoned? I mean, is there anything else we can squeeze from that? No, not really because the Colchester Vars is what we call part of the antiquarian collection. So this is a time before professional archaeology that sort of developed sort of the 70s, definitely into the 80s. And then with the 90s comes all the planning guidance. So professional archaeology, as we see it today, hasn't been around for that long in some ways. So we're looking back 170 years. That one was discovered Um by the chap who owned the land, basically, and he's on the road to Londinium. So this is an area called Lexton, just outside Colchester, which originally is just outside the Roman city walls. So this is prime cemetery real estate, if you want to look at it that way. Um, we don't know a lot about the grave, what we archaeologists would call the context. We've lost all those details. It, you know, these things were, were literally, they were dug up. We have an antiquarian drawing by Josiah Parrish, who drew a lot of these really sort of, some of our star finds in the museum, actually. And it's an amazing kind of alternative resource that we have these watercolours and sketches. Um, but we don't know a lot other than the objects it was buried with. And these are actually on display for the... I think the first time at the museum. So normally you see the vase, but actually it came with a mortarium. So that's a really lovely, well, this one's lovely, mortaria, mortaria uh, mixing bowls. They have sort of grit in them and it's just like a mortar today. So a mortar and pestle. So you, it's, called, it's called a mortarium. What, what mortar did they use pestle. it for in a funerary context? What, what, why oh, they used a... it as a lid. 
to the pot. Ah, right, okay. okay. <laughs> so it's right. an inverted mortarium. It's literally used as a lid to the pot. Um, and then there's a little flagon, a little buffware flagon, so a cream-coloured flagon, really standard, sitting in a little Samian dish. So Samian ware is the lovely glossy red tableware that's made in Gaul. So France, you know, Roman France. In some ways, it's all quite quite simple. The, the Samian dish, the flagon, the mortaria is really it is really it's, is a really it's imported one. material. All simple things. Well, well no, the Samian, but this is the, the Samian thing, dishes. I was going to say this is the thing with the Colchester vase, which is what you guys have found out. Which is okay, Samian where that's imported, but the Colchester vase is made locally. This is the big thing that you've all done, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. This is so. This is the crux of the mystery of the Colchester vase, I suppose. So, what's intriguing about the vase? is that it has an inscription running around just below the rim and it mentions all the names of the people on the vase. And um, it also mentions the 30th Legion, so the last gladiator on the vase, the Retiarius Valentinus, it says, then it says sort of Legio 30. And that's really interesting because the 30th Legion were never stationed in Britain. They're sort of in Germany, near a place called Xanten, at least in the latter, latter Roman period so we've got these named people on this vase 30th legion of it so people have said well you know they're making this sort of pottery out in germany too so it's probably an import and you go oh that's really interesting so interest is import but what someone did a long time ago a curator at cold test museum a long time ago uh, rex hull he studied the fabric and he said no this is um this is colchester ware this is made of of clay from the local region. So we had that reanalyzed and, you know, a um, pottery specialist said, no, yeah, this is Colchester clay. So it's definitely made here. So then it's trying to work out why we have this inscription referring to the 30th Legion, but the pot is made here. And I suppose the other clincher here and the new piece of research we brought in. So I work with a research team, people who gave up their time, Nina Crummy, who's an artefact specialist, Joanna Bird, who is a ceramic specialist, and uh, Dr. John Pierce, who is many things, as well as being an epigraphist. I got this great little research team together, and we looked at the inscription, and we realised it was not scratched onto the pot, if you like, after it was made. So this isn't a really nice pot with some gladiators on it, that someone later goes, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write these names on because I saw this you know I saw this battle in the arena and I want to record it. Instead, we realised that the inscription has been applied during the process of um, making the pot before it was fired. So when it's at a stage called lever hard, so when the clay is soft, and the the absolute clincher here are actually the X's on, when it says Legio 30, well, it's actually Legio XXX. And if you look at the X, it's one stroke, and the other one is superimposed in such a way, if you were to draw a kind of like a stick through wet clay, you would see the superimposition. Now, if you did that after firing, after the pot was fired, you couldn't achieve this. It would just split the, the slip. So that's like the um, the finish on the pot, okay? And it would just chip and shatter. But you can see it's been drawn through wet clay, leaving that mark. So that absolutely reveals the inscription was applied when it was being made. So that's that's really important. So, so th this is what, what maybe that, a bit of merchandise that, 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 that someone's bought at a game or sort, and then repurposed. Well, more than that, I think more than that. What it what it tells us is that this is a, a piece of memorabilia that has been commissioned. So someone has said, "Make me this pot. I want to see these people on it." And I want these names on it. So those names are those people. So we have Mario and Secundus, these two beast fighters. And then we have Memnon and Valentinus, the two gladiators represented on the pot. So what's interesting here is that this isn't evidence for gladiators in Britain. It's not that at all. But what it is evidence for is the first recorded performers, gladiators in Britain. Because this pot was made in Colchester. It's it's a commissioned piece. Someone has seen this event and recorded these people in clay, if you like. And, you know, we can reasonably argue that that happened in, in Colchester. So what, potentially someone who, who might have even commissioned the games and been responsible for paying for the troops' performance or something? Yeah, that's a really in interesting question. So who's made this? So, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, someone that cares about it, it enough to be buried in it. Yeah, right? exactly. So, yeah, it's quite a big thing. Yeah, it must have been ahead of the day of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Is is this the kind of vase that or pot that you use 
uh, in another context? What's it for other than a funerary urn? And if not, is it that important that you, you've had this made for you and you, you're going to be buried in it? Or um, no, it was your favourite pot and your family have decided to stick you in it after your... <laughs> After you're, yeah, after you're good, gone. Yeah. It's um, a good question. Who's <laughs> <laughs> no, put you in the But, pump. like, clearly, it, it, clearly it, it, it potentially, it mattered to somebody at some point, and, and you know, to be buried in that is quite significant. And, and you're being very reluctant to say it's one of the named people inside of that. Yeah, because yeah, I, I don't think it is, actually. No, a lot okay. of people would jump to, isn't it a person? I, I would jump I'll tell you why. To, to so... This is a really expensive product. It's a really finely made pot. In fact, um, Nina and Joanna have, have called this a master potter at work. And the person making it is probably um, someone from the Rhineland, you know, a Samian ware maker or a master potter who, who's come to Colchester because you can see the style in other Samian ware products. So they're not a local person. They're not a local potter. So they themselves are an immigrant, if you want to call them that. They're non-local. They've come in. And it's an exceptionally made piece. Um, so it's a commission piece. That would be really expensive. So it's not that gladiators couldn't get rich in the ancient world. They could, okay? But the level of gladiators, the number of gladiators who reach celebrity status, which they could, is few and far between, really. If we're looking at most people who end their career, probably still fighting, you know. So I don't think this is... And you would maybe record something different on there, but it potentially could be the editor of the game. So Alex, as you were saying, the person who's forked out the money to put the event on, and they just want to record that final scene, which is quite specific, but you know, maybe it was the highlight. You know, If these games weren't very frequent in Britannia and in the local amphitheatre or elsewhere, there is no amphitheatre at Colchester. Elephant in the room here, guys. <laughs> but these things could take place in other entertainment venues like the circus that we have at colchester so it could be someone who's gone Do you know what i'm just going to record this was really special i put a lot of money into this and it was really unusual we don't have a lot of these games happening so i lean towards either an editor someone who's paid for those games or as i think i've said somewhere else a sports nut so th so this vase obviously has an incredible story that you've been able to find out through through science and your investigation. How does it work within the exhibition, and what sort of story are you trying to uh, tell in this in this new show? We have created a, essentially a day at the games. That's what we've called it. This imagined day at the games, and it's like you, the visitor, are a Roman coming to this one day. But we've used the the story of the vase, these gladiators, Memnon and Valentinus. We've woven that into this story. So. The emperor is coming to Colchester and the editor, so in this case the imperial priestess of the Temple of Claudius, is putting on these great games. And the highlight is they've got this, this new Retiarius all the way from Germany, Valentinus, and Memnon um, all the way from another place in the empire potentially. You know, it's a, it's a make-believe story. But we've used these two figures on the vase, these people that we now know existed as gladiators, but they don't come in into this sort of this uh, the centre of the exhibition now. They're actually at the end of the exhibition. We've actually used it as a conclusion. One of my big bits of beef as a museum curator with exhibitions is how people can't conclude an exhibition. You'd conclude any other piece of content. Well, conclude this podcast. You conclude a book. You conclude a film. But exhibitions sometimes just really run flat. And I find that really odd. It's like, what is your takeaway? What's the last thing you see when you leave an exhibition? What's going to stay in your mind? That's what we think about with a, a film sometimes. And then you digest the rest. So for me, placing it at the end has some, done something quite different. So we follow the narrative of the games, and at the end, I'm going to give it away, guys, but then it is on the vase. Memnon wins out. So Memnon, on the vase, has defeated Valentinus, and Valentinus raises his arm with his finger as a sign. It's a well-known gesture in Roman imagery of defeat. So what we don't know is what happened to Valentinus. And in some ways, we'll, we'll never know. That's up for, uh, you know, I pose it to the visitor. You know, what he's, do in, you he's, in the <laughs> yeah, exactly, he's in the vase. He's in the vase, Chris. He's in the vase. Oh, he's in the vase. I didn't even, I didn't even <laughs> think of this. Oh, the, the article's been submitted. I need to <laughs> write it. Can we recall it? He's in the vase. But 
more importantly, more importantly, Alex, Memnon wins. So what we have, we have the vase at the end, and Memnon, we use a graphic uh, illustrator to bring these characters alive, and he's shown as a victorious secutor gladiator. And that's sort of where we end the exhibition. So in a way, the object is we've played with a narrative, um, and it's it's not a backdrop, it's really important, because we've used the narrative from it, we've lifted it, but we've created this story around it. So, I don't know, that's sort of a bit of a bit of a process around design and thinking it, it completely shifted from two years ago when we started the exhibition going it must be the central object to be you know it's not an afterthought but it's gone to the conclusion and we hope that people see this naturally as a conclusion to the exhibition and that's their lasting memory they walk away going that that gladiator was victorious and they're on the VAR so I'm hoping that had some sort of impact um, and I guess with the gladiators we'll the gladiators yeah. being the sort of the the final show of the day of games First having the beast hunts and then the criminal executions and things. That, that works quite well with the way you're telling your story because you can hold that information back and really make it the crowning moment. As it probably was in any gladiatorial games, the final fight, your best fighters, two guys going at each other. And yeah, it's, it's a great way of telling the story, I think. Well, I, th- I think it's a really good place to to end. Actually, I think we've all finished our pints can I, now. Can I, mean, I just, I just, sorry, I just Chris have <laughs> my question, which is in, last in orders. True Chris is talking last orders at the bar. Alex, in, in true academic sense, is is going to be a co- a comment, not a question. Um, oh, Christ. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> what it is quite evident is that just as people comment, as people actually, will come to realise is that Glyn doesn't really care about glitzy gladiators and things like that, but he's more about the every day and amber and pots and things like this and so gladiators was simply the hook in which to get people in to come and look at your stool full of um samian wear and don't, don't, don't uh, all of these other libraries. elements that you're like oh, the, the oh a day, a day of the games involves <laughs> <laughs> exactly i, I haven't, so I haven't seen it yet but i'm very much i'm very much interest. looking to come come and see it well when when's it finishing it's on for a couple more months Yes, yeah, so the exhibition opened late July, but it's on to early Jan 2024. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, ample time to go and see it. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks so much, guys. It's been a great chat as always. And we will see what the future holds. And Chris, I think you're going to take the next chat. So we look forward to hearing what you're going to talk about. <laughs> Glenn, line up a few difficult questions. All right, guys, I'll see you later. Yeah, you, we'll just let him pontificate <laughs> and then undermine him. as That's his usual. That's his own. All right. Cheers, guys. <laughs> cheers. Bye.